Rockdale. I'm excited to be moderating today's webinar, 2020 Equity Outlook, The Tug of War Continues. With us today are Senior Portfolio Managers Tom Galvin and Sheldon Brandau. Tom and Sheldon will discuss the important issues equity investors will face next year. Few logistics before we get started. We encourage you to ask questions by typing them into your console's Q&A window at any time during the session. We will address questions at the end of the presentation and we'll try to answer as many as possible with the time we have allotted. Please note that a copy of the slides can be downloaded from the resources window to the right of your console screen. With that said, we have a lot of material to get through. Sheldon, I'll hand it over to you to kick things off. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to City National Rockdale's 2020 U.S. Equity Outlook. Tom Galvin and I look forward to sharing with you some various insights about what we see uh, City National Rockdale, our opinions and forecasts for the year 2020. Today, we will be covering agenda items that include a brief recap of 2019, some of the major keys to success for 2020 to allow the U.S. equity markets to continue to move forward, and then we'll outline some opposing forces that exist within the economy. Uh, we've kind of described this as a tug of war. Uh, we'll also discuss some other critical issues that will continue to be uh, topics of concern and discussion with your clients, including, but not limited to, the presidential election and generally the current political environment. Uh, so since we have a lot of topics to cover today, Tom, I think uh, we should get started with your summary of 2019 and your thoughts about the keys to success of 2020. Thank you, uh, uh, Sheldon, and hello, everyone. So uh, let's start with a look back on uh, 2019, which has turned out to be a, year of, a very strong uh, returns in equity markets. On the right, we decomposed the total return of 29% that we've achieved. Approximately 2% uh, came from earnings growth, 2% from dividend yield, and 25% from multiple expansion, uh, particularly as it occurred in the second half of the year, based on rising optimism from Fed easing, a modest widening of the yield curve, signs of stabilization in several measures of economic activity, and expectations that worst-case scenarios on trade would not occur. So let's review what, what we got right, what, what we missed, give ourselves a report card. Uh, so on the a positive side, I think we got good grades. We were uh, correct that global economies would be slowing but growing. Some similarities to 2015 and 16 evident, but that there would be no recession. We uh, were right that the secular bull market would uh, remain intact. We also were correct that the consensus forecasts coming into the year of uh, 10 to 12 percent earnings growth were too high. We were at 5 percent. The five is likely to, to look to be around a, a 2 percent, but uh, our below consensus estimate was uh, right. Um, additionally, our four P's framework continued to prove its worthiness as the U.S. continued to outperform other developed markets. Uh, also, uh, got it right that large cap stocks would continue to outperform their smaller cap uh, brethren. And relatedly, we are pleased that our U.S. core equity and HDI strategies had solid years. We also expected increased volatility at the time of last year's presentation and moderate return. So how we score on this kind of depends. Um, our, our forecast was made on December the 12th of uh, last year, and from that date to the end of the year, volatility surged through the end of December 2018 as the market declined 6% through the end of the year and was down close to 20% on the S&P from the highs. So this set the stage for the strong recovery in 2019. So while we were right on the prospects for downside risk as of 12-12 and rising volatility, we were off on the uh, timing. And throughout 2019, volatility was lower that, than we anticipated. We were also off in that coming into the year, we felt the Fed was going to be raising rates. Ultimately, the Fed re reversed course from this forecast and cut rates about three times starting in July. This don't fight the Fed mentality has been a major factor behind the multiple expansion that's occurred. And the stronger than expected total returns for the S&P 500 uh, which might be in the midst of a uh, melt-up um, as we speak uh, more on that to come. Uh, 
And then finally, while the Emerging Market Asia Index lagged, global benchmarks, our Fiera strategy performed uh, well. On this slide, uh, the keys to success as we see them for uh, 2020 um, are here. So we're expecting to see a continuation of a slowing but growing economic um, environment, both domestically and internationally. While recession risks have risen, we do not see a recession in the U.S. in 2020. Inflation should remain low as well. These factors should allow the Fed to remain accommodative. We also need to avoid major policy mistakes as it relates to trade policy and tariffs. The 2020 elections in the U.S. will also be important to see if meaningful changes will occur that will hurt the economic and growth profit outlook that we see. Confidence in spending uh, by consumers needs to stay uh, strong, and their expectations for the future, which has slipped, it would be nice to see, see those pick up. Uh, corporations are likely to continue to be challenged to maneuver successfully through the slowing macro environment, but we do think 3 to 5% earnings growth, down a, a touch from our preliminary forecast for the year of 3 to 7, uh, is more achievable, and the bottoms-up consensus of 10% is, is too high. So adding it all up, PEs, we believe, should remain elevated, uh, particularly as the earnings yield is very attractive compared to bonds. Bottom line, we think the secular bull market uh, continues. Risks are continuing to rise, but at a uh, uh, modest pace. We're expecting moderate returns, 5 to 7 percent of volatility should increase, and the CNR late cycle playbook will continue to guide us going uh, forward. All right, so um, we're going to cover some topics that are we've defined as a tug of war throughout uh, you know, parts of this call today. And if, Tom, in my discussions with advisors and their clients, I rarely hear a positive without a potential negative comment to follow. In other words, as good as equity markets are performing, and that makes us feel great, there also seems to exist a healthy dose of skepticism. I know we at CNR see that as well, certainly as it relates to various economic conditions. Um, can you perhaps comment on what we're seeing in terms of the economic side of, of this tug of war. Yeah, no, very, very, very true, Sheldon. Um, there are a number of uh, tug of war items going on. Uh, we are expecting um, to see uh, uh, it, it continue for some time. Um, as we illustrate on this chart, uh, we believe one of the most important tug of wars is between the positive influence of the Fed and other central banks remaining accommodative and the negative influences of trade tensions and geopolitical uncertainty, as we show on the right. An accommodative Fed has historically been a very positive uh, uh, policy for the economy and for stocks. Lower rates have historically helped reignite economic growth. This in turn accelerates profit growth, increases confidence, drives stocks uh, higher. And additionally, on the, uh, on the chart on the left shows that we might be at the start of another liquidity expansion cycle led by central bank easing around the world. Now, this is important because since the great financial crisis, stock price increases have been highly correlated with the expansion in overall banks' uh, size of their uh, uh, balance sheets. On the right side, trade tensions and tariffs have driven global uncertainties to an all-time high. They've cooled off a little bit with the uh, Phase 1 uh, announcements, but overall, this uncertainty has taken its toll on business confidence and activity. The trade tensions and the use of a broad range of tariffs is a new development. Um, and the influence of these tensions has been a major cause of the slowing global economy, an important reason why the Fed re reversed uh, course and cut rates. Now, not since the Smoot-Hawley Act have tariffs and their threats become a mainstream um, event, and hopefully the trade tensions do not lead to an end of the spirit of economic cooperation that has existed in the uh, Bretton uh, Woods era. So we're uh, watchful on, on that. Um, so um, going forward, we, we think trade tensions, how global growth will fare, is going to continue to influence the path of uh, Fed uh, policy throughout the year. We uh, do view the Phase 1 agreement with China as a symbolic incremental agreement that appears to remove 
the worst case outcome of escalating trade tensions and the implementation of the tariff increases that were expected to come on December 15th. Now, this verbal agreement is not finalized. There's still more dotting of I's, crossing of T's, and legal reviews, et cetera. So uh, we have to see what the final outcome is there. And also, until we get finer, final closure uh, on trade tensions with uh, China, uh, it's going to re remain a headline risk in uh, uh, 2020. On the positive side, the proposed auto tariffs, which we had flagged as a potential risk, uh, does not appear that it is going to occur. Never say never with uh, developments down in the uh, uh, Washington. Uh, but right now, it doesn't appear that it's going to occur, and the probabilities of coming this coming to pass have declined uh, 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 modestly. Right. So, yeah, I mean, definitely the trade war is probably one of the top two topics of conversations that I'm having with advisors and their clients. Um, the second one is probably the presidential election coming up next year. It seems no matter who you support, there's fear on either side. Um, so, Tom, maybe you could comment you know, how this presidential election could potentially impact the economy and, and also in turn the U.S. equity markets. Yeah, no, it's it is an important one and a, a tug of war it is. And so, but before we get into the election, let's just you know uh, touch on the impeachment process as we have to go through that first. So this slide shows uh, two of the scandals that have occurred in the White House in the uh, last uh, uh, recent past. Uh, on the left there, you have the Nixon Watergate scandal. On the right, the Clinton impeachment. Uh, there are similarities and there is major uh, differences. So the similarities are in both instances, it was deny, 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 and many lower level officials were fired, resigned, disappeared, or went to uh, jail. Uh, the differences were the economic backdrops at the time. In the case of Nixon, it was the worst of all times. Inflation was rising, the economy was in recession, confidence and profits were uh, falling. In Clinton's case, it was the best of times. The economy was healthy, and profits were rising, and inflation was moderate. So lessons here is the economic backdrop is very important. Yes, the uh, scandals can exert short-term pressure on, on stocks, but it's the economic backdrop that really uh, powers uh, uh, stocks. So today, we're somewhere in the middle of these two. Uh, the economy is growing albeit slowly. Inflation is low, which is a good thing, and the Fed is uh, in an accommodative mode, which is a, a plus. Now, this tug of war in the current environment of economic growth and political uncertainty is really a uh, meaningful one. Now, history has shown that over the years, the stock market does well regardless of the composition of leadership in Washington. In the 74 years shown on this chart, only 30 of those years if you look at the, the DD, the DDR, and the, the um, composition down at the uh, bottom there, only 30 of those years did one single party control Washington. On the left side, you can see in the 22 years the Democrats controlled Washington, the market was up about 10% um, annually. In the eight years where the Republicans were in full control, it was up um, about 14.5%. With the exception of the post-9-11 period, as you can see on the right, uh, markets were up during all these um, uh, periods of uh, mixed leadership in the 5 to 17% uh, range. So how will the election end up? Well, no one, no one knows, really. Um, the tug of war between the left and the right-leaning populist uh, movement is a potentially meaningful one for the future course of economic and uh, profit growth. Now, while the final candidates and the foundational platforms for the Democrats does remain to be seen, there appears to be a common thread among candidates, which include addressing the equity um, or the inequity in income. Um, there also appears to be a common thread of rolling back some of the corporate tax cuts, uh, putting higher taxes on the wealthy, and providing an even greater array of social services, especially in health care. The Republicans continue to be focused on creating economic prosperity through lower taxes and creating more jobs uh, here in the states. The road to the 2020 election will undoubtedly be contentious and give the 2016 election a run for the uh, money in terms of uh, uh, the level of uh, 
discourse. Uh, now, we have no particular insights at this moment in time as to the outcome. Uh, recent data from predictit.org indicates there's a 74% probability that the Democrats will control the House, a 54% probability that they win the White House, and only a 35% probability that they gain control of the Senate. So based on that, it seems to us that the White House is up for uh, uh, up for a contentious uh, uh, vote. Um, so now while uh, President Trump has the benefits of a solid economy and low employment, which historically has led to a second term re-election for the incumbent, he also has a low approval rating, and recent surveys indicate that his standing in key swing states that he won in 2016 is uh, slipping somewhat as economic activity in those states is um, not as good as the, the overall average. So it does appear that the House is likely to remain decisively in Democratic hands. It does appear that the Republicans will continue to own the edge in the Senate. Um, and so at this moment in time, it appears pretty unlikely that one political party is going to control things. And as a result, it's unlikely that meaningful shifts will occur that will significantly alter the expected growth trajectory the economy is uh, currently on. All right. So while it's not <clears throat> meaningless, of course, we know the presidential elections are very meaningful, it seems like it's still a little too early to call, too early to change positioning in portfolios uh, based on some things that are quite candidly not analyzable yet. Um, so maybe we shift gears and we talk about some of the economic conditions uh, in this tug of war type of environment that are analyzable. Is there anything that stands out as, as most important there? Yeah, so th this this slide here, Sheldon, shows there is a tug of war occurring between stronger consumers as measured by retail sales growth at the top and weaker industrial production at the uh, bottom. Clearly, the consumer is healthy, wages are rising, jobs are plentiful, savings up, net worth is uh, on the rise. So now, while we're watchful of the uh, decline in future expectations component of confidence measures that we've seen, the consumer, by all measures, is on solid footing. Industrial production has been falling primarily because of slowing global economies and uncertainties created by trade wars. So if there is some improvement on the macro environment, then the continued strength of the consumer could lead to a pickup in industrial production going forward. The converse holds uh, true as uh, well. Yes, we know obviously a healthy consumer is a good driver for the U.S. economy and, and in turn potentially the stock market. Um, but uh, I, I do want to point out or have you comment on the fact that while the equity markets have done well this year and there's that healthy dose of skepticism, skepticism out there, um, it seems like individuals aren't necessarily all in. They have money on the sidelines. Um, is that accurate to say? Yeah, no, that is, that is, that is true. So there's there's a lot of measures on uh, equity valuations, uh, and we'll touch on them more um, deeply. But on the left side of this chart, we put up the uh, Buffett indicator, as it's known as, which is the market capitalization of the U.S. stock market as a percentage of GDP. Now, a few observations. This ratio is high. Um, by historic standards and close to the 1990s. The other thing worth observing is that the trend is upwardly sloping. So the distance between the trend and the current reading uh, is not as extended as it was back in the late uh, uh, 1990s. So if the cycle continues to unfold, then uh, this uh, indicator could uh, continue to go higher. On the right, it does appear that there is cash on the sidelines. So what this chart shows is the ratio of M2 to the total stock market valuation. You'll notice in the 1980s, as interest rates were declining, investors took money out of their bank accounts and CDs and put them into the stock market. And as the market moved higher, this ratio went lower. The trend continued until we kind of hit an extreme case in the late 90s, as you can see at the oh, low point there. Now, during the great financial crisis, this ratio moved up higher as fear gripped the world. So looking at these two examples of greed in the case of the 90s and fear in the great financial crisis and where we stand today, we're not too extended um, by um, um, any means. And in, if the darker line moved down to the trend line of that dash blue one, about an estimated trillion dollars could come into the uh, stock market. 
Uh, well, a trillion dollars of demand for U.S. stocks could certainly help keep moving the U.S. stock market in the right direction. Um, so I guess only time will tell on that. Uh, but it, let's let's kind of shift gears now and and look forward into 2020 about some of the critical issues that that we see here at City National Rockdale. Uh, we're all stopping on a slide here that most of those who are on the call today probably have seen many, many times, and it's our economic dashboard, our speedometer slide. Um, if you pay attention to it, over the course of 2019, we've watched several of the greens on this page turn yellow, but I certainly like to stress that yellow isn't an alarm bell. It's simply a neutral. Um, the only two red gauges happen to have the word political on them there in the bottom right, and that's probably not a surprise to anybody on the call. Um, but again, there are less greens on this page than what we saw at the beginning of the year. So we don't quite have the economic strength that we had at the beginning of the year, and our forecasts are going to show that you know uh, GDP growth is slowing down. However, looking at this page, most of it's still green. Half of it's still green. So 10 greens versus two reds is still a pretty healthy ratio. Again, not quite as strong as the beginning of the year, and to that point, we have de-risked portfolios in, in, a diff, in a lot of different ways this year. We'll cover a little bit of that uh, as we continue this call uh, as we go forward. And we're just a touch more defensive, um, leaning into higher quality companies, et cetera. Uh, now, some of, these paid, some of these changes have been made due to these economic growth forecasts slowing down, and some partially due to the fact that the stock market has performed so well this year uh, valuations have increased materially in, in 2019. Um, the next slide actually goes into the data. Uh, we have our forecast there on the bottom right for 2020, and you can see that GDP growth is slowing down, but we still see this as sustainable growth. Um, that sustainable growth applies to both GDP as well as U.S. corporate profit growth. Uh, we at City National Rockdale generally do have a lower growth forecast for U.S. corporate profits than the consensus. Uh, we're expecting 3, and a, three to 5% growth in that area, while some are still holding on to expectations of 10% growth next year in corporate profits. Um, that said, once again, we've positioned portfolios to be of higher quality and of less risk than we, than we did uh, you know, early in, in 2019. Um, so, so, Tom, with GDP growth slowing down two years in a row now and other parts of the world struggling even more than we are, should we be preparing for an economic contraction or a high risk of recession uh, going into 2020? No, great, uh, great, great question. Um, our base case uh, assessment is no. Now, uh, what this chart shows is the history of uh, the ISM over time, and particularly in this most recent economic expansion, where there's been periods of uh, slow, slowing down, many recessions, um, if you were to call it. Now, we, we think there is likely to be a rebound in 2020, but we're not expecting it to be as high as it was in 2017, because back then there was a synchronized pickup in a uh, global growth, the energy patch stabilized, and we had fiscal stimulus coming from Washington via the uh, uh, tax cuts. So uh, many are looking for a sizable rebound. We, we don't see it that way. Uh, the, resist, uh, the risks of recession, as we show here, of 40% is pretty much driven by worst-case outcomes on trade and geopolitical instability if they were to un unfold. Now, speaking of recessions, uh, need, need to touch on that. Um, you know, I think a lot of individuals have a recency bias. Uh, when you mention the word recession to them, uh, they think of the most recent occurrence, that of the great uh, financial crisis. We don't think the next recession will be a, a replay of the great financial crisis, but is more likely to be a mild recession. This chart shows the history of recessions going back to 1949. They generally last 11 months, the economy declining 2.3% or so. So, um, you know, our view is there's not a lot of excesses in the economy. Uh, yes, there are pockets of concerns, such as valuation and some private equities, erosion in subprime lending, increases in loan loss uh, provisioning by banks, but inflation is low. 
inventories are not excessive. So excluding an exogenous shock, there's really no need for the Fed to engineer uh, a, a recession at this point. So we're expecting a mild one, nothing in 2020. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the a chart at the bottom of this slide, we have bumped up our recession risks. But while they've risen, they're really not at the extreme levels that we've seen in the past or levels where we might seek to significantly lower our equity exposure from where we stand um, uh, uh, now. Yeah, and, and on the slide also at the top of the page, um, we won't spend a lot of time detailing the meaning on, on a lot of these uh, points, but we, we, we're charting the output gap of the U.S. economy. And you referred, to, you referred earlier that there aren't a lot of excesses in the economy, and typically, um, when the output gap closes for an extended period of time, on the chart itself there, that's where the, the blue is above the line, above 0%. There tends to be a, a long period of time or an extended period of time where those excesses exist. And more importantly on this chart, if you, if you look really closely, there's some vertical lines that highlight you know, past periods of time of recession um, and, and there tends to be a positive output gap for an extended period of time before a recession happens, which makes sense, right? That's, that's the excesses building, bubbles building, and a lot of different asset classes, and we just don't see that today. Um, so, so again, uh, you know, there's another reason why we think there's still time for the U.S. economy to grow. There, there's, we don't see broad-based euphoria yet. Uh, so again, just a bit more data to support our base case scenario that we really don't see a recession happening in 2020, and we do expect modest economic growth ahead. So with all that said, Tom, how does how does all that outlook translate into corporate earnings growth expectations as shown? Yeah, in three yeah, no, seven. very very important, uh, Sheldon, because you know earnings are the you know mother's milk of uh, stocks over time, PEs ebb, ebb and flow, but we really need earnings growth. So what this chart is, shows is how we build up to our below consensus three to five percent. Uh, expected growth rate in earnings. So we have economic growth this year, 1.9 to 2% or so. Inflation is going to stay contained. We're assuming about 1, 1.8%. Global growth, it's slowing, but it still should be about 1% faster than the U.S. We, we take out about a third and add that back in for the S&P exposure overseas. You add them all up, it's a, a reasonably good proxy. That, and we're looking for revenue growth this year of 5%, which isn't bad. Uh, stock buybacks are likely to decline, but still contribute about 2.5% to growth. Margins, we're assuming, will uh, come down about 1% as uh, wages rise. Always the wild card, we are assuming the negative drag in earnings that have, has existed so far in 2019 from the dollar and oil will moderate and modestly contribute to EPS growth. So a base case is about 7% um, earnings growth um, as we see it. Uh, this year, like last, tariffs are likely to exert an influence. Uh, we have two scenarios there, one that it reduces EPS growth by 2%, uh, so we end up uh, with earnings in that case about 5%. In the other instance, a 4% 4 hit, and it would be 3%. 3 so uh, on uh, tariffs, I want, I want to make a, a couple of comments here. So the Phase 1 agreement uh, that was verbally extended on Friday um, – is a symbolic incremental positive development, right? Uh, not proceeding with the extra uh, tariffs is a good thing. However, the verbal uh, agreements haven't been finalized. Negotiations are going to continue. Phase two, or, or whatever they're going to call it, the timing of which is also uncertain, is also likely to remain in the headline. So the trade tensions with uh, uh, China is um, likely to um, continue. And as I said earlier, auto tariffs do appear to be off the uh, table at, at this point in time. So you take that 3 to 5% uh, uh, earnings growth, and where do we differ from consensus? This slide breaks out the consensus bottoms-up earnings estimate at the sector level for, for the S&P. S&P is about 10. And as you can see, just looking at the uh, various uh, sectors, um, there's a lot of 
optimism baked into that 10%, particularly in those cyclical industries, tech, energy, materials, there's big, big gains embedded into consensus forecasts. And given the low GDP growth rates we're anticipating, it's probable these consensus estimates are going to come down um, as they did um, uh, last year. Uh, so there are some tug, tug of wars going on between the positives and uh, negatives for uh, uh, stocks. Uh, Sheldon, you want to take the earnings side? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think um, this chart is pretty self-explanatory. On the left-hand side of the chart, you know, the earnings per share forces positive and negative on uh, uh, on earnings per share. You got growing GDP, a solid consumer, and low inflation. We've mentioned that before. Those are positives. And the negatives are the trade war, stimulus is kind of dying down, um, and wages are rising. So on an earnings per share basis, I think it's a little bit more self-explanatory and logical. Um, the more unpredictable piece is probably the right-hand side of the page. And Tom, I'm going to have you answer that part of it. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that is that is the um, a tricky one. So uh, to come up with our views on earnings, it's a bit of an art and science. So we take the science of, you know, equity risk premiums, dividend discount models, discounting cash flows, various scenario analysis over the next five years, recessions, mild and, and, and such. And then we discuss it as a as a group, as a team, and basically make a subjective assessment as to where we think uh, fair value should be for for PEs. And it, a lot of it is, you know, the, the factors we, you know, uh, discuss there, moderate growth, Fed being supportive, most importantly, attractive earnings yield of equities versus bonds. That's likely to keep the demand for uh, uh, stocks um, attractive uh, compared to other all all alternatives. The negatives we touched on the trade and the, the geopolitical uncertainty, the election in the U.S., the quant and the liquidity issues can't be, you know, overlooked. Uh, last December we did see a, uh, a problem in markets. I think that was all driven by a rush to the exit from some quantitative factor-based uh, strategies and the liquidity issues that exist there because of the um, um, uh, uh, Fed. Now, as it relates to fair value, uh, let me touch on this one. Just uh, so, what what we do is we take our three to five percent um, earnings uh, number and um, use our uh, our best guesses for the fair value for the PE of about eighteen and a half. Um, uh, 18 to 18 and, and a half. So in our mind, fair value for the S&P is roughly around 31, maybe 3,200 or, or so. Uh, now, before I leave the slide, I want to drill into a couple of things. Firstly, uh, the 29% gain for this year. So to put it in, into perspective, a couple of historical things. So since 1926, equities have increased 29% or greater on an annual basis only about 20% of the time. So up 29% uh, is uh, uh, pretty uh, rare. Secondly, this cycle, this economic cycle, the 25% return is the second highest annual return of this cycle. So again, up there. So the markets could be in a melt-up stage. Uh, we are looking for that because uh, melt-ups are you know, common occurrences usually in bull markets, but sometimes they do signal when you're in the last stages. Uh, Melt-ups tend to be you know, rapid rises in stocks over a relatively short period of time. Sometimes they go vertical. Sometimes they just kind of keep creeping all along. Since 1902, there have been 24 melt-up occurrences um, uh, during the, that time frame. The average return in the melt-ups has been about 13 and a half and generally occurs in about a 60 to 90 day uh, time period. Interestingly, during the mid-90s, Back then, you recall, the Fed was easing. And there's been comparisons made today with the Fed easing to what was going on there. There were two melt-up periods that averaged about 10% that occurred in 60 and uh, 90 days. So extrapolating this, this data, it would translate that the melt-up should take us to about where we are in the S&P as it stands today at about 3180. Now, we all know markets can oscillate above and beyond uh, a, a fair value, so we remain watchful for irrational exuberance uh, to potentially trim and keeping our eyes open for any pullbacks that might give us buying opportunities relative to where uh, fair value should be. 
Uh, on the left, uh, we, we show the historic range of PEs. On the right, our per share earnings forecast. At the bottom part of the chart, you can see some of the valuation uh, metrics. We're overvalued on the 500 on a PE price to book um, basis, uh, cyclically adjusted uh, PEs. But the one most important measure that remains attractive is relative to fixed income, as you can see here. So let me dive into that oh, a little bit more. You may have seen this chart. It's our uh, scattergram of PEs of stocks over the last 50-odd years versus the 10-year. Um, and the uh, yellow line is uh, a trend. And where multiples are on stocks compared to the 10-year yield, it's about where it uh, should be. We're not at, in the extreme level at the uh, tech bubble. We're not at the you know, uh, fear level as in the financial crisis, we're about where we uh, should be. And then if you also look at earnings yield on the S&P 500, this chart takes the trailing earnings yield, which is currently about 5.5%, and uh, subtracts from it the current uh, U.S. 10-year uh, treasury, corporate investment grade, and high yield. You, you can see that this cycle Earnings yield for the S&P 500 has been higher than these all, all alternative um, uh, fixed income investments. So the uh, the earnings yield is uh, supportive of, of stocks. You throw in another two percent for uh, dividends, and it, it kind of supports uh, staying where we are on, on a, a neutral weight uh, to uh, stocks. All right. Yeah. So uh, again, all stocks aren't created equal, of course. Um, so our and uh, our asset allocation committee, our chief investment officer, and obviously the committees that, that you and I are involved in, Tom, have um, sh have put together how we've been repositioning portfolios this year. And I've alluded to it before. We're buying higher quality today than we have been in the in past years. This chart, uh, which many of you are familiar with, uh, just basically look at the triangle positioning on the page. And the further the triangle is to the left, the less we're going to allocate to those asset classes, and the further to the right, of course, the greater we will. So the top part of the page, U.S. stocks favoring U.S. large cap core. Uh, we've eliminated or t certainly taken to a minimum exposure mid and small size companies this year in the United States. And then internationally, uh, the only international markets we're really uh, looking uh, to, um, to invest in is emerging Asia. Uh, so, again, um, it's nice visual on positioning. Um, Tom, if you want to give any rationale as to why we position this uh, in this manner, I'd, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sheldon. So um, if you're new to the firm, you may not be aware that in addition to our traditional comparison of relative economic and profit cycles around the world, we have our proprietary approach to global regional equity allocations we call our 4Ps framework. Uh, I'm not going to dive into it deeply on this call. Uh, Matt Perona and I have done some webinars, and there's white papers uh, available for you to review. But just to you know, highlight it quickly, the four Ps. The first one is policy elements that support growth. The second one is population growth and productivity of the population. The third one is the potential for innovations of industry of high intellectual property. And the fourth one is overall profitability. So by this proprietary approach that we have, you can see the U.S. is clearly the best region to invest in, particularly compared to other uh, developed markets. And Egypt, EM Asia is a uh, standout uh, winner compared to non-EM Asia. Now, the four-piece framework also, while, while it helps us keep our, our compass pointed to true north, just want to highlight how we closely monitor uh, economic activity and, and profit cycles are around the world. This chart shows the net margin for the S&P 500 versus uh, indices in Europe and uh, uh, Japan. So a couple of observations. Firstly, net margins for the S&P 500 recovered quickly to prior peaks and continue to move higher. Other developed markets, especially Europe, struggled to expand margins after the initial recovery. And both Europe and Japan recently, it looks like their margins are rolling over. As we look into 2020, we believe estimates for margin expansion and EPS growth uh, in all parts of the world, but in particular in Europe and Japan, are, are too high. Don't forget, indices such as uh, in, in Europe and Japan have over 40% of the indexes in cyclical, high fixed cost industries such as energy, materials, 
industrials, and financials. So there's more earnings risk should a uh, recession um, arrive or less earnings upside in a slow growth um, and, and environment. So uh, now one of the differentiators that we have as a firm is that we have the strength of our uh, convictions when it comes to um, equities. Uh, you may have seen this slide. This is the rolling five-year return where we compare the S&P 500 uh, to the other major developed uh, uh, markets on the left and EM Asia versus EM on the right. So si significant outperformance for the U.S., which we've been overweight, as well as EM Asia versus uh, non-EM um, Asia. And we, 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 we continue to hold that view. The uh, uh, performance advantages may narrow over the next coming years. There may be a couple of moments in time where we question this uh, overall positioning that, that we have, but we think with our four, four P's rating, the profit cycle uh, analysis, I think uh, we're in good uh, shape there. Now, as it, re as it relates to large cap and uh, uh, smaller cap stocks, as uh, Sheldon mentioned, where you've been uh, minimally weighted those. And to, you know, simply stated, uh, a lot of that comes from the structural issues that uh, mid-small caps have are very similar to developed markets. Namely, that they have about 40% in cyclical um, industries, so their earnings are more cyclical. There's a lot more earnings risk in a slow to declining economic and, and environment. So, um, so as you can see on this slide, margins for mid-small cap stocks have struggled. They've been meaningfully below larger uh, cap stocks. Now, there was that fleeting uh, benefit from uh, tax cuts, uh, the 2016-17 period, but they have not been able to uh, uh, keep up on the uh, profitability side, and their ROE is roughly uh, 10 to 12% as opposed to 18% for the S&P 500. Optimism also here looks uh, too, too high for us, even though estimates from the consensus have come down for mid-small cap stocks with uh, projections today at 13 to 18%. The, for the 400 and the 600, we, we see more uh, a downside risk there. Um, and so in our late cycle playbook, similar to uh, the uh, position we have with developed markets, we, we want to be underweight mid-small cap. Uh, that uh, perspective has uh, worked for us over the last five years. Uh, the return for the 500 has, has been higher. And going forward, we think that's going to uh, continue. All right. uh, Thanks, Sheldon, Tom. you want to take this bear market slide? Yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot of data on this page. Um, the whole purpose of including this slide is is to reaffirm that we don't see a recession on the horizon. We don't see a major risk of a bear market. Um, again, a bear market being 25, 35% decline in the stock market. Um, historically, this, this slide points out at least one of those four conditions on the far right-hand side of the page have always been present along with bear markets of the past. And the one that dominates, of course, is recession. Um, it's interesting to point out uh, in our current cycle, which is the bottom row on this page, we do have a yellow box. It's not, it's not red yet or pink <laughs> under extreme valuation. So again, bear valuation does not mean bubble territory necessarily. So um, we see fair value as a growing concern or the fact that equity markets have moved up. Uh, but again, a price correction itself isn't something where we uh, you think would lead to a bear market. And historically, the two times that extreme valuations led to a bear market, the recovery period of time was actually only three to six months. So investors are uh, uh, positioned appropriately from a planning standpoint. Uh, their portfolio values recovered very quickly. Uh, so that's really the point of, of this entire slide. Uh, but, Tom, in, in the specific category, large cap, core equity, where you've got your greatest responsibilities, um, obviously the quality characteristics have truly paid off this year. Um, we have really great lipper rankings on not only this year, but one, three, five-year periods of time. Um, there might be a link on this console somewhere where, you, where the viewers can click on that. But uh, more importantly, Tom, maybe you can elaborate on where the success came from this year or focus on how we've repositioned that portfolio in preparation uh, for 2020. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sheldon. Yeah, uh, 2019 has been a uh, 
great year. Uh, we're up about 34%, 400 bips ahead of the benchmark. This marks the fifth of the last seven years where we've out, out, outperformed. We've had three years in a row. I don't know if we'll have four or not, but I think we're well uh, positioned going into 2020. Uh, how we've outperformed this year and over the last three years, the, the last five years has been uh, very much influenced by our three uh, uh, pillars chart here, where we strongly believe we can outperform the S&P 500 over a full market cycle by investing in the best industries, the best themes, highest quality companies selling at uh, reasonable prices. Uh, themes for us continue to be very, very important to us. Uh, to achieve long-term capital appreciation, and tax efficiency, being able to identify those key secular themes, those mega trends, and finding the right stocks to buy and hold for a long period of time is key. We continue to be focused on the key themes uh, as we highlight here on, on the slide and remain focused on those high quality franchise companies with visible earnings growth. Um, and also, as you can see on the outer edge of the circle, we are being cognizant of the late cycle nature and have increased our focus on buying quality companies and controlling our risks. So a couple of things on, on risk. So um, one of our um, outperformance areas this year and the last uh, seven years has come in our positioning in technology and, and healthcare. It's been a great source of alpha for us. Uh, we've done this while staying true to our mantra of buying quality companies at reasonable prices. We do not own what I refer to as the bubblicious stocks, uh, those you know tech or healthcare stocks that are really excessively um, high in uh, valuation. You know, it, there, there there are bubbles for sure in corners of technology and healthcare. Just look at the private um, um, equity world um, this year. Uh, we 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 works that that company blew up because of the high valuations and it canceled its IPO. Uber and Lyft, their their IPOs are down 35 to a uh, 40 percent. We are outperforming, but we are not taking risk by owning these stocks that have an average PE of around 140. We also have our emphasis on quality. So you can see on the far left that the average quality of our stocks in, in the large uh, cap core strategy using our proprietary quality ranking is higher than the S&P. So said another way this year, we have outperformed by taking less risks. So that's a, uh, that's a um, good, good thing. Also, we've been actively managing our, our risk factors, as you can see on this slide. Our belief is that early in the cycle, you want to take risks. When economies are recovering and growing and incremental operating margins are high, you want to have higher beta exposure. You want to have higher earnings volatility as this produces excess returns. And then when incremental margins begin to peak, you want to start taking those risks down. So where we stand today, our beta and earnings variation is less than the market. This is part of our late cycle uh, uh, playbook and should uh, serve us well going forward. Another part for active management has been in our uh, exposure to growth stocks. So one of the foundational views at CNR for the last seven plus years is that we are in a lower for longer cycle of economic growth, inflation, and interest rates, and that in that environment, companies with the best opportunity for visible growth are going to outperform. Now, as you can see on the left side, growth stocks have strongly outperformed uh, value stocks on a rolling five-year five, five year, uh, basis. Um, and we have been emphasizing growth, and that has helped us to out, outperform over these uh, many years. Now, on the right, you can see we have been lowering our exposure to growth stocks deliberately over time as the valuation of many growth companies have increased. And we continue to hold this course for the time being, uh, despite those low valuations that appear to be in quote-unquote value stocks. Keep in mind, those industries are very cyclically oriented, have high earnings risk, and at this point in time, don't easily fit into our late cycle um, approach. Uh, our uh, overall uh, positioning of the portfolio in, in 2019 has been uh, driven by our uh, overall stock selection and the positioning that we have in certain industries and, and, and themes, some of which are, are here. So uh, in our late cycle playbook, we have wanted to minimize exposures to the companies impacted by uh, uh, tariffs, 
and we continue to hold this view. For example, in the industrial sector, we have avoided those heavy metal companies, as I like to call them, those that are tied to building infrastructure, especially in uh, uh, China. Uh, so instead of owning the deer and caterpillars of the world, we have emphasized uh, service companies such as uh, Cintas. In technology, <clears throat> we've emphasized software and uh, services stocks that have strong visibility of earnings uh, that are driven, di uh, driven by differentiated business uh, uh, models such as Visa and MasterCard, Microsoft and uh, Adobe. In healthcare, we continue to avoid companies with high risk from drug prices and continue like Edwards and uh, Thermo uh, Fisher. Now, we did during the year trim our exposures to many of these stocks to lock in some of the sizable gains that we've had as part of our prudent approach to active risk uh, management. Now, in addition to the macro and economic factors we discussed at length earlier, there are other key aspects we'll be keenly keeping our eyes on in, significant, in industries of significant importance, not only to U.S. stocks, but for uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, core um, uh, portfolio. The first is in tech. Uh, as we know, this cycle, tech has been the place to be. Profits have been ro robust as consumers and corporations continue to Im Im embrace it. Uh, part of our outperformance has been coming from our, tick our, our, uh, our uh, tilt towards uh, tech. Uh, so we're watching uh, trade wars and, and tariffs. If we get a worst case there, that could potentially disrupt overall uh, demand and profitability. We're also watching concerns over uh, uh, regulatory changes that could impact big tech. Uh, there are risks. The FTC and the DOJ is investigating Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon. Now, as it relates to the regulatory risk, we are underweight these, these stocks. So we should be in relatively good uh, uh, um, uh, shape there. Uh, the second industry we're watching is healthcare. Now, the pricing of many healthcare products has been under scrutiny for several years, uh, leading to uh, diminished um, opportunities for uh, growth. Now, depending on how the election goes in 2020, uh, pressures on the industry could go up and seep into other areas of healthcare that have not been uh, presumably sub subjected to the in in intensity uh, going forward. So, we're going to keep our eyes on those uh, two two areas. And uh, Sheldon, why don't we wrap up and take some uh, uh, questions here. So we got about eight, eight minutes. Yeah, we definitely want to make sure we answer some, some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, but in summary, the takeaway is there's lots of tug of war issues that we've got outlined today. Um, our base case scenario is that economic growth will continue to be modest, but there won't be a recession in the United States in 2020, allowing corporate earnings to grow three to 5%, U.S. equity returns in the range of 5 to 7%, again, even off of what some people view as elevated valuations today. Uh, volatility has been relatively low since that pullback in 2018, so looking forward, we expect a pickup in volatility as well. Not the best combination, lower returns, higher volatility, but once again, if you've positioned your portfolios and planned, uh, uh, we've planned it um, collaboratively with you here, uh, for your client portfolios here with your portfolio managers at City National Rockdale, um, we think we can navigate through this given the fact that we've also been leaning into higher quality, lower risk types of equity exposure. Um, so should risk meaningfully shift in the wrong direction, uh, we are certainly prepared to take further appropriate risk reduction uh, measures. Um, and, and we're always talking about that uh, <laughs> multiple times per week, the portfolio managers and all the risk management pieces of the, of the firm. So we're, we're prepared to make those actions if, if that, uh, those, those situations were to come to pass. So, uh, Sheldon, I, I see one of the questions kind of touches on that um, topic that, that you just you know, mentioned on. Um, the question that came in was, if a recession should happen, uh, what is Rockdale's reaction um, gonna, gonna be? So. Uh, let's uh, start there. And so we spent a lot of time uh, at Rockdale trying to avoid those periods of capital destruction, as I like to call them, where, you know, it's more than just a 20 percent market uh, correction due to volatility. But there's actual 
recession risk, capital destruction risk. And so we spent a lot of time um, analyzing that. And as part of that late cycle playbook and the um, recession risks, we always have a plan of action ready to go. Uh, within my world of U.S. core equities, I have what I call my doomsday portfolio. If a block swans shows up in the room uh, tomorrow, I'll be selling stocks with higher earnings variation. The higher cyclical um, industries would be uh, sold uh, down. Um, so those uh, um, you know, capital preservation aspects of our unique approach to asset allocation and investing for in, in individuals is going to be one of the differentiators for us and the active uh, management if and when the next recession does uh, show up because there will, will be one at uh, some point in time. So we've been there, done that. We have the playbook ready to, ready to go. So rest assured that we'll, we'll take those um, um, actions um, uh, you know, right, right um, away and uh, and in an appropriate uh, uh, um, um, area. So um, related to, to that question, we had a question that, that came in about uh, our late cycle view and some of the performance of some of the more early cycle uh, stocks, such as uh, housing and semiconductors. So um, what we mean by late cycle, I think is important to go over. So. Late cycle, as uh, Sheldon pointed out in his output gap slide, late cycle can take 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 some time to unfold. Uh, generally, it's a you know two year kind of window by the time that output gap gets over uh, onto the uh, top side of the line and for the recession to uh, start. So uh, it, our our world that we're in late cycle that the majority of the growth is behind us, uh, that there's not going to be a lot of fiscal stimulus coming down the road. Monetary policy is there and it's active, but it's not likely to be uh, stimulative to uh, accelerate uh, growth um, economically. And unless there's a breakthrough on the trade front where those clouds on the horizon, those uncertainties go away, that we're going to stay in late cycle uh, you know, for some uh, time, and that the ec the acceleration in the economy isn't going to um, happen. Uh, semiconductor stocks we have stayed away from, uh, mainly because of the concerns that we've had on uh, 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 trade uh, risks. There, uh, we seem to have dodged the worst case bullets there, but the you know battles between China and the U.S. is of a strategic um, area. As it comes to tech, the whole made in uh, China, uh, 2025, uh, and you know being front and center of the trade uh, tensions. If a worst case would have un unfolded uh, there in, in that regard, semiconductor stocks, in, instead of being up 45% or so for the year, would have been down quite a, a bit. So we um, managed to keep up with uh, our selection of stocks in in technology, and we, we've outperformed tech this year, despite not owning uh, those uh, uh, stocks. Um, housing has had a nice uh, rebound this year. It's a cheap. We have a exposure to, to housing, so we don't feel like we're uh, missing um, anything uh, there. Uh, Sheldon, did, did you notice any other uh, questions that we can touch on in the last uh, two minutes here? Um, you know, I think one's worth pointing out, and it was a straightforward question about has seen Asher Rockdale ever done better than the S&P 500? And the answer to that is, is multi-layered. Obviously, Tom, you pointed out um, your core strategy has outperformed in five of the last seven years. Um, doesn't mean it's going to perform at that proportion every calendar year. Um, and, and quite candidly, you know, there's lots of different components to allocations in City National Rockdale portfolios. Um, our high dividend paying stocks act a lot differently than, than core equities and, and growth equities in, in general. But I'd say um, in, in certainly recent history, uh, the growth stock pieces, uh, core equity, and then um, uh, a few years ago, of course, the emerging market Asia uh, space did it incredibly well. So growth equities um, have, have done very well uh, under uh, in, in, within portfolios. So we're, we certainly build portfolios to uh, manage risk, and we have different goals uh, established for every client portfolio. Um, uh, 
on a certainly on a risk adjusted basis, we think we've done exceptionally well, especially in those last five uh, to seven years that you pointed out, Tom. Yeah, and and those th those details, as um, Sheldon mentioned, you know, should be available in the console. Uh, five out of the last seven years, uh, over the cycle uh, since we started the uh, strategy at the end of 2012, we've outperformed the S&P 500. We are top eight percentile versus the uh, Lipper large cap uh, core peers. That's the uh, peer group that we uh, use, and we we think the uh, proof of the pudding is 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 there. And uh, when cycles turn down, we're we're looking forward to outperforming on the way down because uh, of the uh, attention to risks that, that we take, making sure the portfolio is not overly extended as we live up to our capital preservation and avoiding periods of capital destruction approach. So I see we've hit the uh, 2 o'clock hour. Let me turn it back over to uh, Joe for some closing uh, comments for you. All right, everyone. That was a lot of information, and we're at the bottom of the hour, so I think we could end there. Thank you all for joining us. A post-webinar survey will pop up shortly in your console. We appreciate your feedback and any suggestions you have for future webinar topics. If you have any questions or comments related to today's webinar, please contact us at info at cnr.com. You will receive an email notifying you when the replay becomes available within 24 hours. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.